Adam Gettle. Hi. Where did you go? Jesus. Well, no, I watched it on YouTube on, on my mainframe computer over there. Uh, but uh, now you're here? Yeah, I mean, to, to say that somebody is the, the savior of, of anything, they have to be around a little more than I've been. I don't know how you could be a savior of something with like 1.5 shows. <laughs> <clears throat> no, you have more than 1.5. Okay, stop. Okay, Look, well, we're going to get to those shows. We're later. not statisticians. 1.7, 1. 1.5, 1. who's, who's counting? Yeah, evidently you. Um, <laughs> my, first, my first memory of you is 1991, you were in your early 20s and I was in my early 70s. And now I knew you came from a very fancy showbiz family, but to me, you were shockingly funny and oh, open and loving at that very young age. All gone. It's all <laughs> gone. But no, no, that here's was. the thing, I found a picture. Oh, great. <laughs> Let's see it. What? That's it. I know. What the fuck? Wait, Julie are Warner. Are we allowed to say that word? Yes, Julie Warner. Totally. Amanda Green, Brian yeah. Green, me, yeah. and young and, you. And I would say that you're a little closer to John Davidson there than Jim Caruso. <laughs> that's, you know, that's always been my dream. I know it is. You'd like to be close to John Davidson right this minute. Hey, <laughs> he did Pajama Cast Party. Did he? He did. Oh my God. Well, tonight is a, is full of kismet sort of happenstance. I mean, the EL thing is just a phenomenon. I'm glad you brought that up, that everybody's last name ends in EL. Isn't that weird? Uh, I mean, it's beyond weird. It's almost, some, it's almost creepy. It's just downright strange. And then um, and then how brilliant those two women are. Um, Shireen course, is, is a really spectacular new artist, and wow, what a sound. And there's something so accessible about her. Uh, there's no, she's so unguarded as an artist, you know, when she's singing and I'm very grateful that she sang my song so well. And, uh, but I mean, when she's singing anything, uh, really, have you uh, seen, uh, have you seen West side yet? Uh, no, um, we have to go. Would you buy that for me? Yes. I'll buy that ticket for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so wait, so wait, when we met, I, I knew all this stuff about you, but I, what I didn't know is that you had been this very fancy boy soprano at the Met as a as a little per, little kid, like well, that kid on top. Well, I was, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the I'm the kid up there. It looks like I have sideburns, which is not was not physically possible. So that's what that picture looks like. What the hell kind of a photo is that? An article from the New York Times. I'm doing that typical like pointing at the music uh, at the piano thing, which is just why, please, God, why. <clears throat> no, but can I just say, both Haley and uh, Shireen have, ha, are, uh, came up through music from the very beginning. <clears throat> and it, it is something that, you know, it's, it's, in, it's inculcated into you and gendered into you uh, so deeply from, from such a young age. And then, <clears throat> I don't know, it's just interesting to me that both of those terrific artists are, uh, came, came up the same way. I mean, I was doing it from such a young age when I was... Two years old, I would come home from the park singing 59th Street Bridge song with with an eye patch, by the way, with an eye patch and long curly blonde hair and pink plastic glasses. And people would say, poor thing, is she blind? And I'd be like, slow down, you move too fast. Gotta make in my carriage. Because <laughs> I had had an operation on my eye. I had an operation on my eye and I was like this, like, hey, oh, like, uh, yeah. Did? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I've come through such difficult stuff, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> really have had it tough. But I, I know you have. But the weird thing is, uh, which I also didn't know, at age 13, you faked the end of your career as a boy soprano. You know, I know it sounds uh, unlikely, but I, I just couldn't stand the pace and the madness of, of being in operas as a boy soprano. I just, I, I did kind of freak out. Like I had like a very minor, like nervous breakdown at, and I just started faking that my voice was changing, like trying to talk really low and stuff. <clears throat> I, I got a Merkin so I could seem like I was developing. Is that too much? Are we on air? Is this live already? I thought this was just the warm up. Talk. This is the warm up. This is the rehearsal. Okay. okay. But you, you, 
you were afraid your voice would crack. Yeah, and I just got tired of the stress of it. And I, I, I love singing and performing. Once I became a tenor, um, which I have unbecome since then, but I, um, I, I didn't have to worry about singing high because I could sing really high. But, but when I was a boy soprano, I was really a second soprano. But because I could act and I looked the part sometimes, they would stick me in things where I had to sing an A and I developed all kinds of wild superstitions to try to beg the spheres and the gods to let me not crack, you know, and all these other beautiful, perfect young boy sopranos could sing, sing that way without any, any problem. So I had <clears throat> lots of witchcraft going on to, and I just got tired of the stress. I, I just love that it had to, uh, I mean, I think all of our fear is that we're gonna crack just crack up yeah and, sure and then it started for you so early <laughs> oh yeah oh well at the age of 10 i mean i knew that i wasn't up to snuff but or maybe even up to pitch but i i did the best i could um and it was a wonderful experience i mean just like Haley and dream were saying it's it's uh uh it's an incredible way to grow up to grow up around music and around people who are making it on a professional level and adults uh, and adults who are who are making shows from nothing you see it start out nothing and then by the end it's wonderful and it just gives you a sense of how to respect the process and uh all all of those things that are so much part of our lives you know i, I back when we met you were just funny adam to me funny weird adam in a red suit i remember <laughs> uh, but all of a sudden at these spectacular parties you started to bring out your guitar and sing songs that you were writing and I was like, wait, what? You write? I had no like, idea that Funny like, Adam was he's just not just, he, huh? he's, he's not just a trust fund kid. He could <laughs> play the guitar. What's this? No, but I, I was like that. I was like, and you were playing, you were like working with yodely stuff that ended up being in Floyd Collins. And it was odd and beautiful. And of course your voice is stupid. Um, <laughs> that no, was you know, all, but you don't know because you're not from here. All Jews from the Upper West Side can yodel. It's a thing. <laughs> you didn't know that. Did not know that. <laughs> of course, for our audience, your mother is Mary Rogers, who who co-wrote Once Upon a Mattress, one of the yeah, all-time yeah. beloved musicals. Your grandfather, Richard Rogers, won 34 Tonys, 15 Oscars, what? two Grammys, and two Pulitzers. <laughs> Oh God! Was, was there ever, was there ever such a thing for you as just being mediocre, Adam? <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I, that's basically my most of my day. That's my day. Um, no, I'm very familiar with it. I'm very comfortable in it. That, that's I. Those are my sheets. Those are my pillows. I don't believe you. <laughs> um, the expectation and the pressure to achieve something overwhelming. I, did you did you put that on yourself, or is it just? what I'm now putting on you. Well, I will try to draw a line between the expectations that I have on myself because I, I don't think many people much care really. And I'm, you know, I think that's not self-effacing to say so. We're all pretty much just interested in ourselves. And I, you know, my expectations on myself um, are fairly high because I would like to at least be in the ballpark. Um, and the blessings that I do have in this life because of my grandfather have allowed me to take my time and be very strict about certain things um, and take longer than than most people take, which has given me the reputation for being very slow. And I, I think I deserve that reputation. But um, what I what I probably don't deserve is is for someone to suppose that I that I'm not that I'm not doing a lot of work. I, I do a lot of um, throwing things out and, and not thinking something's interesting enough or even finding out that something turns out to be something someone else wrote already. You know, like those have to get thrown out. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things you got to do can get you in something yeah. into the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, there was no expectation for me and my family, and I've lived up to that. So that's. <laughs> I don't think you have yet, but I think you might. <laughs> they were just thrilled I wasn't in a corner eating paste. Um, paste. I, I remember you and I were talking once about your family position, where you where you fell in the family position, and you coined a word. Do you remember that word? No. No. Antisappointment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I really nailed that. 
Uh. <laughs> that is hilarious. And you also said, I need to do, I need to work. I need to, to have something to pass down to my forefathers. Yes, yes, exactly. Why do I remember all these quotable quotes from you? Because of this. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> and me drinking Coca-Cola and coffee. I remember. Yeah, you, don't, you need help in that department. Jesus. I remember everything that happened at Studio 54. <laughs> so there you really? go. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I was. It wasn't El Morocco. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hate you right now. Okay, so one of the thrills of my life was taking my mother to see Light in the Piazza at Lincoln Center. My mother loved Adam Gettle, ladies and germs. I loved her too. She was so beautiful and well turned out and fun and lovely. She was really good. That's sweet. Well, she sure loved that show. And I, I saw it many, many times. That must have been such a crazy huge time for you uh, to say nothing of and then winning the Tony, two Tonys for the show. Was it, I have to think that success and that um, outward, you know, people like really supporting it and you was maybe more relief than, than we could ever know coming from where you came from. That's a perfectly good word. It's, there's no better word. It was an enormous relief. And I, it actually allowed me to quit smoking, which I had a problem with quitting. Or as Mark Twain would say, it's easy to quit smoking. I've done it 250 times. <laughs> um, so um, I was able to quit smoking because I quit on June 18th, 2005. It was the week after the Tonys because I thought, Every time I want a cigarette, just think about the fact you just won two Tonys and see if you cannot smoke a cigarette until you want, until you don't want one anymore. And it worked. I haven't touched a cigarette since June 18th, 2005. And if I win another one or win something good, I might be able to quit drinking. So I'm just, you know, that's what, that's how my ambition works. <laughs> People, please. Find it in your heart to give Adam. Yeah, it really was a relief because because um, just to be able to get something, and as you know, as as everybody watching this show knows, it's, it's to get something from conception to the stage, no matter what the stage may be, and then <clears throat> uh, to get it to Broadway is is a, a complicated process with a lot of moving parts, a lot of uh, people, uh, and and a, a lot of you know, egos and everything and talent. And it's just the most complicated process. And that's one of the reasons it's <clears throat> so much fun to be involved with uh, and so frustrating. And, but to, to get something on and just know that it was basically what I intended uh, was enormously satisfying, still is. And uh, I, I think that maybe not before people are blessed enough to get to that point, but certainly afterwards, they realize that um, that's one of the reasons we do it is just sort of Wow, this crate this is such a complicated machine. <clears throat> it, when you get something on stage, it's a miracle. It almost it, has at that point, it has nothing to do with talent. It has it's just all the things and I know I know it's pretty it's pretty uh it's pretty banal, but it really does have a lot to do with luck. I mean, and I've had plenty of both, uh bad and good. I I mean I the opening night of missing hymns are one of our leads. Um broke her leg and was in a, couldn't, so there was just a, a work light on the stage and, and we were, we were supposed to maybe go on Rosie's show and her, her musical director was going to come see it opening night and we didn't have an opening night. So there's that, you know, that happens right and left for all of us. Right. right. And many of the people who are watching, I'm sure. And, and uh, I know you've had, had nothing but bad luck and I'm hoping that <laughs> changed tonight. But <laughs> I think, I mean, hello. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, but then I've had enormous luck in getting something on on stage that's that's that unlikely. The Lightning Piazza is not a a very likely show in a lot of ways, and one of the reasons that I stuck very carefully to doing it the way I thought it should be done was that I thought that was the way that we could maybe maximize our luck in getting it on stage. I.e., really focus on the fact that it's an unapologetically romantic score that the concepts at play are largely. Uh, about love, about getting it, having it, losing it. 
and that the, the music for those two things is really the same music. It's, it's just contextualized differently and that everyone in the audience will be able to identify with that was the basic bet that we laid down. And, uh, you know, I felt it was important to really make a bet like that with a show that was that unlikely. Yes. Well, you're kind of unlikely as your stock and trade. Myths and hymns, by the way, this past year, Ted Sperling conceived and conducted a four-part digital production of Myths and Hymns, one of your greatest Is projects. Is that Ted in the picture lying there with on the feathers? That's Ted. That's Ted. Gosh. And Marie Osmond, strangely, <laughs> next to him. Um, but, but this project combines Greek tales uh, with an Episcopalian hymnal. That is not, that hmm. is not normal. <laughs> that is well, not. I think it could even be considered sacrilege. I don't, I haven't gotten in too much trouble, but uh, one of the nice things is that um, some of the songs get done in, in churches in the South and Southwest. And um, that's really a fun thing about it. Um, the, the way the show kind of fits together um, was that Tina Landau, the director came over one day and said, what are you working on? And I said, well, I've got this stack of things over here and this stack of things. And she said, well, play me everything. So I played her everything. And she said, I hadn't even thought of it. She said, well, maybe they could go together. And we realized, you know, over the next few months that really they, they do in a way in that, in that hymns are, are um, who we would have ourselves be, um, who we would like to be. And, and, and the myths are who we actually are <laughs> and how wow. we actually behave. Wow. And that's well, about as narrative as the project gets. The rest of it right. is up to the director and the performers. And, and in this case, Ted Sperling, who produced it beautifully and all the great illustrators. And, and it's free on YouTube. Uh, it's got, it comes in four chapters. So if you hate it, you don't have to watch that much of it. You can just- They're not gonna hate watch. it. The cast, Adam, the cast, mm -hmm. Kapatia Jenkins, Michael Kilgore, Norm Lewis, Renee Fleming, Kelly O'Hara. Michael McElroy. <clears throat> Uh, Cheyenne Jackson, who's yeah. so good on and Hero and the Ender. a real homunculus. I mean, he's ugly, that Cheyenne. He, I know, he's, he's a pig. What happened to him? Did he get in a terrible elevator accident? What happened? It's just awful. It must be awful to be him. And that voice. Oh, my God. Shireen, yeah. Uh, yeah. Dove Cameron, Jennifer Holliday. Did you ever oh. think Jennifer Holliday would sing? Oh, God. She... That was just like, it was like chewing, like being eight years old and chewing a piece of the best gum and that we're watching her do that song. She made the song so much better than it is. That's all I can say. <clears throat> it's great. You guys at home, find it on YouTube, the four <laughs> different uh, 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 segments of myths and hymns. It is absolutely, each song is like a short film. Some are animated, some are very simple. All are gorgeous, the orchestrations. Is that Don Sebesky? Well, it's, it was Don Sebesky and Jamie Lawrence. And, and Jamie was absolutely central in, get, in redoing it for this reimagining that, that Ted uh, did. Jamie was in the studio uh, 12 hours a day for months. Uh, yeah. because, because of COVID, everyone was singing from home into yeah. various um, appar apparatus. I mean, you know, m mostly iPhones or like, you know, megaphones, who knows what they were, how they were recording it and sending it in. And Jamie had to like line it up. It was an, a Herculean task just uh, administratively. It's, uh, it was thrilling. I thought oh, I'll watch a couple of these just to kind of get in the mood for, you know, talking to you. Cause I need to be, you know. You gotta to get in the mood. Yeah, for you. Wanna, no. um, it, I watched every single frame. It is so beautiful. Your, here's, here's what I think about you. Uh, your creativity <laughs> with words astounds me. It always has. You once wrote to me that you were on a cruise ship with your parents and you called it a floating liver spot. <laughs> That's funny. You're like the Joan Don't River. That means. Of <laughs> uh, and you also said that somebody we know in common had herpes of the soul. Yeah. That's well, I, it was you really that I meant, but. But who, who, I mean, you've grown up with the smartest people, the most literate people around you your whole life. But who, can you well, point you know, to somebody and say, they gave me my love for words? Your mom? Steve well, Sondheim? I mean, behind me I have, if I may just adjust the angle a little bit, that is my favorite part of the, uh, uh, of my library. And um, 
it's all the books on language. And so some came from Bert Sheveloff, who wrote Forum and um, uh, the Frogs and was a terrific friend of Steve Sondheim. And, uh, the other ones are from Marianne Madden, who was a very close friend of Steve Sondheim's and my mom's. And uh, the other ones are from my mom. They're just the word books. And um, I've always loved those, but I did grow up around a lot of those people who were so articulate that they didn't really have time to finish their sentences before they started the next one. And <clears throat> I, I, uh, I am not that quick minded. I generally just start with the end of my sentence and then do another end. And no one gets what I'm trying to say, but that's how smart I am. That must be why I enjoy you. Uh, the, <laughs> ease, the ease that you have with language, um, uh, most writers would, would kill for that. And I just, it's, it's one of the things I love most about you. Uh, <laughs> when I told, you know, the throngs, many of our fans, uh, the thousands of fans really, that, uh, that you were doing the show, they all said the same thing. What's, what's next? What's next? Oh yeah, there's some things. There really are some things. I know. I. Uh, all right. So, <clears throat> uh, one is based on a wonderful movie by Danny Boyle uh, called Millions, and it's the show is finished, and um, we are in the process of of talking to a couple theaters about putting it on in a sort of provisional way to get it up on its feet, and then uh, we have some you know, pretty well-known producers who are interested and we, we would love to bring it in. Um, it's about two boys who, who uh, lose their mother to cancer. The youngest is eight years old and his brother is 12 and, um, and, and they have to move and go to a, a subdivision outside of Albuquerque and um, start again. They don't know anyone. And, and uh, so they're just sort of trying to sew their hearts back together and then they discover a huge bag of money um, uh, just falls from the sky practically and they don't agree about what to do with it and one of them the older one wants to invest it because mom died dad could die we need to invest this we got to have a, a nest egg here um and then the younger kid is no we have to give it away because if you give the money away then you get so much more back and both very legitimate and justifiable points of view and it turns out the money is stolen and the person who stole it is a murderer uh, and is and knows that they have it and so for the entire show they're running for their lives and sewing their hearts back together. And it's it's a really beautiful story about, you know, a boy or really two boys who, who just want to be good. And you don't see that a lot um, these days. And that's the kind of thing I believe in. And for that reason, I think it is unlikely, but at the same time, it's a four quadrant show, as they say, rather crassly. It's a, it's a, it's a show that should appeal to all kinds of people um, and not just theater insiders. and. I, I think it's some of my best work, and it's very propulsive, and it's it's not all this violin stuff. And oh God, give me give me a break! It's it's uh, quite propulsive and fun. And then the other show that's basically done is is called Days of Wine and Roses, and it's 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 uh, it's based on a, a play by J. P. Miller, and um, it was turned into a lovely movie, a heartbreaking movie with Jack Lemmon and and Lee Remick, and it's a love story. And the obstacle uh, uh, is is uh, is addiction. Um, and one of them recovers and one of them doesn't. And uh, so again, uh, you know, cheery, cheerful, you know, <laughs> light, light, fair. You yeah. couldn't, you couldn't write Thoroughly Modern Millie? <laughs> I, apparently I couldn't because it was written and it wasn't written by me. I could not write it. Oh, that was not you. No. Uh, well, no. I mean, you, you had I wrote, a great... I wrote somewhat Modern Millie and it didn't do well. And then someone bested me, totally bested me. You wrote Thoroughly Modern Lily. Um, <laughs> kind so of close. modern Lily. Kind yeah. of. Um, I wrote Antediluvian Lily. There was a whole series of Lily. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good rhyme that. Oh, God, oh, yeah. Hello. Uh, you were nominated for a Tony for the score of To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, yeah, that was, that was a crazy nomination. I mean, I... I felt like I had to apologize to all the legitimate scores that also got nominated because uh, mine was an incidental score. And when I say incidental, I, I mean incidental. Uh, it was a nice score, but you know, it was a, it was supporting the action. So, but I was very honored to be there. Um, and I, uh, I just regret that I had so many chins or because the way I was sitting when they, you know, when you get, when they mention your name, you yeah. know, I think a lot of the people really thought it through and they were like, you know, <laughs> I don't know what they're like, uh, and I was like, 
<laughs> it, that was not good. Are you saying it was the one time you were unappealing? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'll say it. You've had such great mentors, and now yeah. you're inspiring students. You're teaching. Um, I, I love teaching. I know you do. Is it is it so stimulating? It's it's an it's an essential part of my life. It's a net gain. Um, there's something about it that really purifies me. I mean, it feels like some kind of uh, antioxidant almost uh, spiritually. Uh, there's no script required. You know, God is on my shoulder. The the, the, the students, the young artists, um, any age artist, they they just bring the, uh, the, the they they bring the itinerary and and the script with their artistry. Um, and I like, I like to work concentrically outwards from what is sort of at the core or, or appears to be the core at the core of someone's work within a song, um, as a performer within a song, as a writer, and just try to sort of take them on their terms and, and then use what I know or what I think I know um, to help maximize that. You know, I think, I think that teaching for me is, is a kind of a, the concept I would use is that uh, on the one hand, you have a person's, an artist's signature, who they are, what they, who they come into the world with. Um, and on the, the other hand, you have technique. And, and one of the fallacies and misapprehensions is that technique will somehow suppress originality or naturalism or um, being relatable and all that. And of course, technique is what emancipates it and, and, and liberates it and allows an artist or a songwriter to end up either making a character or making a good song this, this camera thing is I'm pretty dyslexic with it. I'm trying to do a triangle, but God, it's hard. And, um, and then, or, or a life. I mean, you know, you have the ego here and you, and you have discipline here. And if you get them into a feedback loop, um, you get a life. I mean, to me, those kids are, are so lucky to, to be, to hear the messages that you've gotten from the people you've gotten them from to pass that on, to pass on what you already know, the yeah. deep knowledge that you have in your own self. You've done this at SMU, NYU, Harvard, Yale. Have you been to my alma mater? Uh, wait, the Don Bosco School of Electronics? Really? Richland that Community College in Richardson, Texas. Anybody? I would love to teach there. Can you hook me up? I mean, I'd love oh, to. Oh, I can make a call. Uh, I got an honorary driver's ed degree, so. Really? Uh, remind me never to note to self never drive with Jim <laughs> you know no I I just I just love it so much and it really um, so I'm starting to teach here at at home I have this large open space and you know no furniture and I've just started to ramp it up again now that we're not you know now that we can you know take our masks off yeah. and all that yeah. <clears throat> yeah well I mean I told you told me we could talk about anything <clears throat> yeah uh, I want to ask you about your obsession with watches. Okay. Does it, do people know this? I don't think Some people do, know. but um, yeah, I love what well, I talk about watches uh, more you than you pulled out I the most extraordinary watches the other night when <laughs> we, we had dinner. I was like, what the hell? These are, these are works of art. How yeah, they that, really are. How did that happen? Well, I mean, Perhaps on the, in the, on the coarsest level, you know, watches are made by hand very, very carefully and, and, and very beautifully when they're beautifully made. And uh, just like uh, shows and operas and, and musicals um, and performances, they're, they're meant to last for hundreds of years um, and give people pleasure and understanding and, they, and have meaning for hundreds of years. So that may or may not be, you know, that may or may not hold water, but it sounds elegant. So anyway, but the other thing is that, um, I've always been fascinated by the passage of time, and, and maybe that's related to the fact that I always feel behind and slow with my work and so forth. But when I was seven, or just eight, I was in my first year at camp, and those days you went to camp for two months, and I loved it. And all these kids were like, mommy, dad, I've got to go home. I, you know, I, miss, I miss, I'm homesick. I was like, I am not, home. I was camp sick the whole year when I wasn't at camp. Um, <laughs> um, because we could just have fun and like did we you know we grew all our own food and like raised the pigs and the it was just great. Oh god. And what camp was this? It was called Treetops in the Adirondacks. Just an unbelievably great place. 
And uh, I went for like six summers. Um, you know, I, I insisted on going even when I was like 19, 20, 21. I was just, uh, well, everyone else was like eight and nine, but I just loved it so much. And no, I, and so one, one night in my first year, <clears throat> this kid who was in the tent with me, one of my tent mates, had a watch, uh, a mechanical watch that was glow in the dark, you know. I'd never seen it before. And I did his chores all summer uh, in order to wear his watch at night when we were sleeping. I have to give it back to him during the day, but I would just lie there and under my sheets and look at this thing glowing away and ticking away. And I don't know, I've never not been fascinated by them. I love that. And because of a glow in the dark watch. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're just absolutely beautiful. I mean, I've always liked a nice watch, but yeah. since that night, I'm like following all these watchmakers on Instagram and, and you made me look at watches in such a such a new swell there, way. And there are some inc incredible young watchmakers who are doing incredible things and really changing the industry. And and you know, I won't get too much into it, but there, there's a there's a whole you know there's so many subsets in this world, and the internet is only a lot giving us access to them. You know. Cool. Um, <laughs> I'm done. Uh, you're you're just fascinating as always and funny. Too. What fun to talk to you. I know. Do you have anything you need to play us from your studio? Do you need to turn anything on? Oh, uh, you know, I am in the middle of some things. I'm having a lot of fun with work and doing a lot of improvs and uh, sort of I've I've gone ahead and bit, bitten the bullet and broken the machine. I sort of have to break break the machine every time I start new things and, you know, retool the factory and, and not do what I did before. And I've I bet. That's that's often pretty painful at first because you, you, not that you have nothing left to say with the old machine, but you don't have a new machine yet, and it's a difficult passage because you're not sure if you ever will have something new. But I feel like I've squeaked through, and now I'm in a new terrain with a new machine. So, well, each one of your each one of your shows are are so different and unique, and and so on your world. I mean. Floyd Collins was, where was that, Kentucky? Yeah, there were so few cavers um, at like Beth Israel. Uh, no cavers? <laughs> the speedwalking community was super small. No, I, I love doing something because you know it's a great excuse. You, get, you, you, can, uh, it's a, you can just write what you want because you're not writing about your own milieu. So you don't have to be, because and it all comes down to Steve Sondheim, as we know, everything does all think he is the great Oracle. Oh. And I don't mean that, uh, by the way, if you look carefully at that picture, there's something in my teeth. I'm not, <laughs> <kidding you. laughs> there really is. Can we blow it up, Ruby? <laughs> no, it's in there. <laughs> I was like, I how love that, picture. that was in New York magazine. I was like, how could you do that? <laughs> Please. I Photoshop pictures. I put on my Facebook page. The least they could have done. Yeah. Anyways, it all comes back to him, and um, and I just I'll say this in in closing, and I have to remember what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, um, my words, my choice of shows, um, all in some way have to do with knowing that if I want to make any space for myself and for what I what I want to do in this world, I can't try to encroach on what he does because there's no hope of succeeding there, and so. Um, you know, I, I went pretty far afield. I mean, I went to Barron County, Kentucky. You know, he, he, he probably he, he probably will get there one day, but thank God I got, you know, he, I just, I was like, well, at least he hasn't done this show. And although he, he, did, know about, he did know about the material, but he, he hadn't written about it. Oh, I love that show. Oh my <laughs> gosh, I love Floyd Collins. We went to Philadelphia. Did I go with you? I feel like I went with you. Well, we were going together in those days. I mean, we were dating. Yeah, yeah. It was lovely. See, that's something people don't know. And I developed that show at University of the Arts, where Haley uh, teaches. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Great school. It's a great school. Camille Polly, a brilliant, brilliant scholar. <clears throat> Adam, I love you so much for doing that. Thank you, For taking your time. And I know you don't do a lot of these things. And... Just, I'm irrepressible. I would, I would, I would do, I would do them every minute if people ask. So thank you for asking. You're on every week if you want. Okay.
That might be annoying. Right. Annoying right. for you. Uh, <laughs> I love you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're at home and you are sitting on your couch or in your bed, just start <laughs> applauding for Adam Gettle. Deserves it. <laughs> oh, wow. I love you, my friend. Thank you. Love you. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye.